So thank you very much for the warm welcome. Hello everybody from my side. Today I'm going to talk about the four SDV concept and I guess you all know SDV, so software defined vehicles, but uh, you don't know what the four is about and I don't disclose it now. I disclose it during my talk and uh, I was already happy about some of the questions here because it's related to exactly that topic. But before I go into this concept, I would like to show you um, an illustration which has been shown to me by, by Goldman Sachs this year when I had a meeting with them. It's actually from Bloomberg. And it, it just somehow s summarizes where we are today. So I was lately on a conference and the title was uh, Moving Beyond the Hype. And I think that's, that's where we are. So I still remember 2017, end of 2017, the hype of the automotive industry. At that time, I was still with Bosch, so lots of former colleagues here. And we were discussing about leader, a lot of startups, extremely high valuations. Um, you paid 30 million for five people, leader startup, uh, lighter startup at that time. <clears throat> and I still know at that time there were predictions about robo taxis um, available 2022, 2023, and it came a little different. Yeah. So then automotive after 2018 went into a very difficult situation, Corona came, and I think today we are beyond this hype. So a lot of reality came through. Also if you look for example startups, so, so we are kind of a scale up, but still you need to show tangible results. You cannot sell a vision only anymore. So if you, if you only have a vision, you do not get funding. And this creates for a lot of startups issues because if you do not have not right now already a source of income, so revenues, and you still predict to have some revenue in the future, you really need to have some tangible results to get further funding. And that's why we also see that quite some of the startups <coughs> or companies file for bankruptcy or have uh, really issues or do pivot and so on. So it might be not so much a problem for the big corporates, even they are in challenging times, but especially for smaller companies uh, who are still developing products, it's an issue. Why do we also, why do I see actually we are beyond the hype? We just heard it about, um, uh, you know, large language models. So I still know my first experience with ChatGPT by end of last year, I was fascinated. I actually also, the first thing I did was, was coding. I, I told it to write me a bro, just like draw me a sine wave. Then I first had to install on my laptop a few uh, libraries uh, in order to make it happen. But what is amazed uh, how easy it is to program. So that's one of the things I think in AI, we really have also moved beyond the hype and it's getting slowly and steady. It's introducing in our everyday lives. We have then the robo taxis in San Francisco and in China available, of course. Now, in the meantime, Cruise has some difficulties, lost its license, but still uh, Waymo is active. So there's also, it's visible, there are robo taxis there. And we are working together with a lot of OEMs on the next um, highway pilots, chauffeur systems. Also, this is coming, becoming a reality. So we are in a state where the hype is over and reality comes through and, and moving towards that. And now looking at another chart is, you know, there's uh, software is becoming more and more important as we already heard. And um, you can see here there is um, data from McKinsey about ADAS, AD being the biggest market for software in 2030. And I still remember, so when I started my career um, working on parking systems, we had this very small easy use. Um, but still we're managing to do semi-autonomous parking system at that time. And now you have these huge computers, you have a very high complexity. So in the meantime, I think modern vehicles are one of the most complex software products with million lines of code. Um, we also did some aerospace in the past, so I would say uh, it's even more complex in terms of software than, than for uh, the uh, airplane industry. And of course, uh, when you look also here at that slide, you see that only, let's say, 60% is application development. That's what the end uh, driver sees. And the big portion, like 40%, is integration and validation and verification. And these systems 
are very complex and that's one of my 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 major topic of this talk is is that it's actually managing the complexity how to manage uh, the complexity in such a system and one other now it's interesting so i showed you mckinsey data now it's bcg data and um, uh, bcg is working together with the world economic forum so you see a slightly different representation it's not exactly the same cut of data but what i found is very interesting is that the market for vehicle software is so small compared to the application market but where is currently all the problems where is what is what is what is why wh what is the reason for all the delays currently in all the sops it's actually not the application development it's the vehicle software platform that's what causes most of the delays um, right now and if you then look at the complexity which is here on, on the right side so you see that's that's an example derived from one of our projects uh, it's it's an estimation of course you have around 100 applications but you have 500 roughly execution entities then you have 5000 data elements and in the end 50000 interfaces so this middleware is a very complex layer and uh, you have to when there ever there's a change you have to adapt to it so you can somehow containerize functions but the middleware has to everything goes through this middleware and that's where actually there's a small market um, little willingness to pay we discussed it already with OEMs as well no standardization you have standardization below and above but not in that level um, and that's what's causing quite an, an issue now what does it mean so just as you all know so you have the when you when you look at the automotive stack so we have the tool chain then we have the applications i already said it's for example parking emergency braking then you have uh, domain functions uh, we already there's also a company here doing uh, sensor fusion perception and so on then you have the middleware and then you have the the basic software you have the operating system hypervisors and then below the hardware and then if you i mean what is in the meantime for an oem what is what is the the differentiation so we are not differentiating by the engine anymore the designs are becoming similar so differentiation is done by interaction with the driver and by being quicker in updates uh, functionality all this is um, important in the meantime for OEMs so the problem is now if you have for example here um, we have um, 100 applications again and you just do all the possibilities how you how you would manage it how you would orchestrate it you have actually more possibilities than atoms in the universe then you add the constraints of course then you have less um, possible um, configurations but it's at the end still a huge solution space and you can see it here you have um, 46 cpu cores six hardware accelerators tnn switches virtual links and so on so the complexity of this is use is is tremendous and solving it is a is a big issue so and on the one hand side you know there is there is a problem inherent complexity so it is a difficult problem because all these functions are also talking to each other um, and um, then there is solution inherent complexity and the solution inherent complexity is also not only that these products are very complex we also deal with a lot of legacy so there is a huge legacy in most of the oems um, and you have to overcome this as well so the one inside is it is a complex problem and at the other side we still also have this legacy we need to solve so that's why when we compare with startups in the automotive industry with young oems so they don't have this legacy but that's why they can come up with quick and fast solutions and already have software built in from the beginning now 
looking not only at the in-vehicle stack, also looking at the cloud-based tools, so adding to that already complexity in the vehicle. We also have now um, everything needs to be cloud native in the meantime. So you have to have a middleware which is cloud native. You have certain things in the cloud. And we can actually learn from that company, is my opinion. So the first companies who abstracted hardware from software were cloud companies, hyperscalers. And actually, that was their success to abstract hardware from software. And that's one of the big issues today. So that at, at an OEM, so you you either so in the, in the meantime you first talk in my opinion to the semiconductor um, players um, to Qualcomm, Mobile Eye, Nvidia, and then actually you choose the classical tier one, and then you decide who does the integration software, who does the manufacturing. So the whole automotive industry has changed, and um, we need to adapt to this. And one example is, for example, that we can learn from um, cloud native companies how they do it. And there's things like virtualization, which are necessary. There is over-the-air updates, which is mandatory, because only by over-the-air updates you can actually have upgradability um, during the life cycle. You cannot e so easily upgrade the hardware. So that's why it's important. Yeah. So now that was the, the topic of complexity. And um, we talked a lot, or I talked a lot about software. And that's exactly the point. A lot of people in the automotive industry do not come out of software, so come out of other domains, other areas. And when we always talk about software-defined vehicles, it implies that it's all about software and uh, that the problem is software. But software is only a small part of it. So that's why now I disclose um, the 4 SDV. Um, we say it's, it's not only software, it's actually system safety, security, and software-defined vehicle. And we just heard it um, about security. Security is one part of it, but also safety is another part of it. And in the end comes the software. So, and um, most of the attributes or functions related to um, software-defined vehicles are, of course, over-the-air updates, connected vehicle features, um, customization. But when you remember, the biggest market is ADAS AD, and in ADAS AD, it's all about safety and security, and thinking actually from, from the system. That's, in my opinion, um, one of the, of the main uh, main topics that actually it all starts with an architecture and only if you have a good architecture you can also then um, do the next things and an architecture which already have safety and security and um, certain other attributes inherent and then you at the end can do the, the software so let's have a look what um, does it mean um, when we talk about the four SDV architectures? I already touched it. You see that there is um, different architectures, um, zonal architectures, you have zone-based architectures, domain architectures. And in my opinion, it all starts with the system approach. So it's, if, you, if you do not have the right system, um, then also it's hard to, to write software. So you need to understand the requirements, you need to understand what exactly um, is required. It's like in a, in a factory. So when you have a factory and um, you build cars, you do not just place in all the machines and connect them. So of course automation is important and that's important to have like a high productivity, but at the end you have exact planning what exactly do you need. You, you know exactly which place you have which kind of machine, you know exactly what kind of safety requirements, and the same is it here. So you, know, you need to know exactly what does the architecture look like. And then again, you also have to think of how many variants. So I think a big topic is, is all the variants we have. So when you want to have an architecture which satisfies all the variants in, in an OEM, 
then your architecture might, might be way too complex in order to be solved in time. So you need to also think on how modular, how flexible do you do it in terms of um, uh, achieving the results and, and making it happening in time. So another view on that is um, the architectural view when we talk now for uh, autonomous driving or driver assistance on the architectural view. So what you can see here is the fail-silent architecture, but when we are moving ahead, it goes more into fail-operational architectures, and there we have to have um, uh, different thinking. So the architecture, so you cannot just transition a level two fail-silent architecture to level four uh, fail-operational um, uh, architecture. I will come to that on the next slide, how what we propose as uh, being a good fail operational architecture. And you have to have requirements, so you have boundary conditions. So when you detect, for example, a pedestrian, until you steer an actuator, you only have a certain time budget and you need to be within that time budget. That's what we say here as a software view on Send, Think, Act. To also have a software which complies to that and make sure that within a certain time you have a reaction of the system. And of course then you have to build in um, all the, the requirements what we have here. Um, safety by design is already in there and um, the security norms what I've just written here on the slide. But now let me explain really the fail operational architecture and I would like to start first with the impossibility results. So this is from Professor Coppertz, um, and he said there is um, four impossibility results. So first of all, it is impossible to avoid single events upsets um, in non-redundant hardware during the lifetime of an ultra-dependable system. It's impossible to establish the ultra-high dependability of a large monolithic system by testing and simulation. It's impossible to find all design faults in a large and um, complex monolithic software system. And it's impossible to precisely specify all edge cases that we can encounter uh, in a driving situation. So what we propose as a reference architecture uh, for fail operational systems is a main AD. So what you all know, that's what you, what you, when you, when you drive a car, so how the car behaves, how the interaction is with a driver, is the main AD. So that's where what you all know from current uh, driver system systems. And then next to it, you have a safety monitor. This safety monitor only checks whether the main AD is within certain um, Regula regulations within certain boundary conditions complies to all the rules. And then you have the fallback AD, which is also a separate um, uh, unit, which only has the tasks that if there's something going wrong, bringing the car into a safe state. So the safety monitoring is on the one hand side checking the main AD level two system, whether it complies to all the rules, um, and also checking whether the fallback AD is healthy and um, works. And then you have above a safety decision logic with only less than 10,000 lines of code, which is an ultra dependable system, and then decides whether the main AD is active or the fallback AD comes um, active. And by that already safety is inherent in the architecture and also security can be built into this architecture. So that's what we propose as the next architecture for level three plus systems, for chauffeur systems, or then for autonomous driving, by having these four independent um, fault containment units um, in this architecture. Now, having touched at complexity, having touched about the architecture, of course, uh, Next to it is also, and that's, that's still a big problem currently, is being fast um, and, and, and being, like, being able to um, develop functions, best-in-class functions fast and integrate them into the car. So that's one of the major issues today, that we are too slow and that, that there's a huge delay in terms of um, bringing functions into the car. And 
So there we have, for example, at TTEC, we have two major uh, tools. So one is the motion-wise creator, one is the SDK. And it's already important that right at the beginning you have like a, a system verifier, you have the learn and freeze, um, then we have actually a middleware creation, scheduling suite, and then at the end you have to have like a everything automated in kind of a software factory. And for the developers also you have to wor have virtualization like ECU virtualization, software in the loop environment and deterministic re-simulation. And at the end what we want to do is to enable the customers uh, to have much faster testing of their functionalities. So nowadays we need 80% of the time to actually make the, the platform available and there's almost no time left for testing the functions and that has to be the other way around. So we have to have an early testing and availability of functions so that they can be tested and also be introduced fast into the market. If we now look what is in that middleware, and um, the middleware is, as I said, really one of the most um, complex um, levels in that automotive stack. And as I said, there is quite some, some standardization below and there is some standardization above. So it's, it's a lot about workload planning and orchestration. It's about handling the communication. It's time synchronization, health management, virtualization, and then also integrating certain standards. I think that you cannot do everything alone, so you have to integrate a lot of parts already, and then out of that, build a middleware, taking open standards, incorporating them, and building and abstracting actually the hardware uh, from the software. And that's also, if, if you don't want to rely on only one supplier, you have to have this abstraction between hardware and software. Otherwise, you always rely to exactly one company which does everything, and that's what the OEMs do not like, and that's what was always not uh, in the past. It was always you have, could choose out of a lot of different suppliers who to take, and in the meantime, there is some connections which are hard to break, and only if you abstract again hardware and software, you actually can achieve that, that you can always choose who is providing the best functionality and then choosing different uh, suppliers um, offering exactly this functionality. So what are the, the business impacts? Uh, in our projects, we, we currently see that. So, so the, the projects we have is, that there are actually, a, you know, it's, it's not enough pre-work done. So exactly what I said, we have not enough system thinking at the beginning. So, and that's, and compromises in, in the architecture. And at the end, it leads to a lot of effort. It's um, a lot of debugging. You have unpredictable um, validation and verification and testing at the end. We see that and you all can read that in the media about software um, causing SOP delays. Um, and that's a lot of money. So our prediction of what we have usually as a number is that I think six months of SOP delays, almost three billion euros um, for big OEMs. And that's a lot of money in, in that system. And what we would like to do is shift actually the effort more from the end, from testing and validation to the front and have an architecture already, more time spending into the architecture in virtualization, in faster integration, and then um, also having um, less effort than in validation and verification, and of course a better utilization of the hardware resources. And motion-wise, the project we offer actually is, is already in um, more than uh, two million cars. So we also learned it the hard way. So some of the projects were really difficult when you first do first time do a serious project. You know all the issues you have, but we went through that, and the first two million cars are already in serious production, and there's many more to come. And what we are currently doing is um, modularizing and offering different kind of modules of that middleware, so you do not have to take the complete middleware, you can also take parts of it and integrate it, and uh, that's what we are working on. So, 
coming to the end. At the end, it's really thinking in systems. So only focusing on software is not enough. So at the end, it's about system safety, security, and software. It's about development acceleration, industrializing software. And currently, it's all about solving integration and complexity right now. But we are moving also towards uh, EE operating systems with the zonal-based architecture. And then in the future, we're also looking into service-oriented service -oriented architectures. And um, that's where we are also focusing right now. Thank you very much. And now open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Dirk Linsmeyer.